Thank you for coming to uh, join us for the Great Expectations panel. We're going to get started. Uh, everybody's here. Thanks for your patience while we get everybody mic'd up. I'm fine. I'll stand. Yeah. I think everybody can hear me. So we've got a great panel. Uh, the topic uh, we've, we've, we've called this Great Expectations, the, new e the Great Expectations, the New Enterprise Stack. And we're really focusing on the evolution of uh, OpenStack as an enterprise platform. Uh, we've got some folks here representing the service provider side of things, the vendor side of things, the end user side of things, customer side of things. Um, we really wanted to start off a topic about uh, a discussion about, uh, uh, you know, OpenStack and, and how it's delivering on enterprise expectations and highlight a couple of key areas. Everybody on the panel has uh, kind of talked with their teams about um, the key areas where OpenStack can uh, improve or address enterprise requirements more effectively uh, and the things that we should put on the community's radar. So real quickly, want to run through and introduce everybody. Uh, starting here on the end, we have Mark Mule, who was just on stage, did a great job moderating the, the panel for the, the uh, um, the keynotes from uh, Comcast. Uh, Jesse Proudman from Blue Box, the, the, the CTO and co founder or founder of, of Blue Box. Uh, Cebu from uh, Cebu El Maraju from uh, eBay, chief engineer in, of cloud. Uh, Devananda van der Veen from uh, HP, a master technologist and PTL for Ironic on the technical committee as well. Uh, Dave McCrory from Basho, CTO there. So, and then uh, Benny, uh, Benny from Ravello, the uh, co-founder, chairman, and president of uh, Ravello Systems. And finally, uh, Jared Ray from CenturyLink Cloud, the CTO there, one of the founders of, uh, of, of uh, Tier 3. So to start off, guys, uh, we just want to check with you on the panel. Uh, the panel wanted to really get a sense for who's in the, in the audience. And could you just give a sense for who in the audience is a technical person from the uh, dev side of things? Uh, how many devs do we have in the audience here? And then from the, uh, the end user operator side, someone running a, running a cloud. And then finally from the, uh, the service provider side. <laughs> and any, any, any other category you'd like to represent, just raise your hand so we have a little sense. Great, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot to Ram. This three Ram cloud done category. Great, thank you very much. So um, right off the bat, we, we had a lot of conversations over the past few weeks. Guys, had, we had a lot of fun last night talking through some of the topics at dinner. Uh, we're talking about what enterprise expectations are for OpenStack, and we wanted to spend a few minutes talking about, very simply, uh, what are enterprise application workloads, and how are they different from the kind of other workloads that are out there that are uh, becoming much more popular and, and, and uh, uh, prominent in the, in, the, in the environments that we're managing with OpenStack. Can you talk a little bit about what an enterprise application workload attribute list looks like? Maybe you could start us off, Mark. Sure, happy to. Uh, Mark Meal with Comcast, thanks for having us. And thanks to the developers in the audience for putting together this great product. We depend on it, and we thank you for all the, the great work. Ooh, now we have a lot of volume. Um, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I personally feel like the, the workload shouldn't be that different. But, but reality is when you get in front of a developer, the developer has lots of things to think about. Um, and unfortunately, at least for me, in my experience with enterprise applications, a lot of the development happens outside of Comcast. And so that means that we're dealing with third-party vendors that certify a vertically integrated stack of things that in many cases go all the way down to specific releases of kernel, and that bothers me to no end. So working with um, the, the sort of the third-party ecosystem, the developers outside of our four walls of Comcast, is probably the single biggest requirement and the single bit of biggest impediment for us to get our stuff onto, onto OpenStack. Thanks, Mark. Benny, uh, you guys uh, spent a lot of time thinking about workload portability at Ravello. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how you uh, evaluate and consider an, an enterprise set of requirements for applications right. and workloads. So the way we see it, the current uh, enterprise application, you're call, you're, like you're calling them, are built this way. So the application itself is very closely connected to the hardware, and it's an optimization of almost a point function. Uh, where when you're talking about the cloud, there is a clear separation between the infrastructure and the application itself. Mm -hmm. It's not clear when you're developing the application where it's going, you're going to run it. This is not the situation right now. And because of that, customers are running into many issues, like the first question they would ask, what about the performance? What about SLA? Uh, you want to be able to separate those when you are providing an answer to them. Uh, one trivial example, I think, uh, Everybody here that was running recently on a cloud like uh, 
uh, Amazon experience, uh, they basically, because of security, had to pitch uh, virtual machine, uh, their hypervisor, sorry. And because of that, they brought the entire service down. They didn't bring it at one time, they did it over a few days. But this is something that enterprise will never tolerate. You can always raise your end to the IT and say, well, you cannot bring it down because there is a big business running here. Uh, in uh, Amazon or in some of the other public cloud provider, you'll get an email, read the instructions, how you build, how you build application for the cloud. So mm -hmm. this is something that the enterprise is not used to today. And there's no, there's no one app, one, excuse me, one platform for all apps these days. Absolutely not. Uh, and, and Jared, you guys uh, build a, a pretty robust enterprise grade platform over at CenturyLink Cloud. Can you talk a little bit about the customer expectations for enterprise? You've been doing enterprise cloud for some time now. What's your take? Yeah, I mean, we, we right now uh, service thousands of customers, mostly in the enterprise space. And, you know, when we talk to our customers today, it's mostly on two, two big things. What we call traditional enterprise software stack which is normally a software vendor basically provided something and it traditionally is used to a bare metal configuration. You know, it's, it's made that way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the enterprise software, and we've been working with our customers on this, stop saying enterprise software, because if you actually look at how technology has changed because of cloud, if you look at it now, that's not enterprise software. That's just a very legacy architecture model that they actually built. Um, a lot of our customers are now moving to a more enterprise model where they don't care if a cloud goes offline. It, it's fine. They don't care if VMs go offline. They, they're able to stay up. And, and that's one of the big things that we've seen. Right now, about 85% of our workloads still today require high SLA. And so it's at least four nines plus. They can't have blips even on networks. We're actually having uh, a lot of traditional vendors now uh, saying that they can't even handle a seven second blip on a network. Wow. Mm. So we have to model completely to that, and that is extremely hard, especially when you start going into like an OpenStack architecture or something that's a little bit more uh, you know, fan out model. What are you seeing in terms of diversity of workloads and, and diversity of platforms that enterprises are expecting you to support? What do you guys support at CenturyLink, CenturyLink Cloud? Uh, uh, hu huge split. I mean, we, we see a massive amount. Uh, a lot of back office is now traditionally moving to us, uh, which is surprising. Most of the time you hear clouds doing web-based applications, mm -hmm. things like that. We have a ton of back office moving to us. A lot of them just, they want to get out of their data centers. You know, this year alone uh, at CenturyLink, we have 57 data centers. Our customers have moved out of 20 data centers of their own, just basically porting into our cloud. So it's a massive change for them. And it's really a question of what the application owners do. You know, if you have an application owner that thinks in a cloudy way, it's mm -hmm. much easier to get them onto OpenStack, as opposed to if you have an application owner that, as Jared was saying, sort of keeps the traditional vertically integrated, you know, tightly coupled data layers with middleware and you know, web tiers and so on that aren't easily separable then they're going to stay in an enterprise data center for a long, long time. But if you've got people that think about sort of the pets versus cattle mentality, yes. and you're on the cattle side, it's much easier to migrate them into OpenStack. How, how much of that do you think is rooted in the legacy of Windows uh, as a platform <laughs> uh, and applications that are built on Windows uh, versus applications that are being architected on, on Linux today? Yeah, you know, I think we see it across all the different uh, environments. If if yeah, I don't want to pick on the Microsoft gang too much, but uh, that was the, the beginning of a lot of IT um, yep. for a lot of companies. And that legacy has sort of, uh, it has a long arm of the law. And that legacy has been carried forward and forward and forward into Linux architectures, whether, you know, it just doesn't matter. The platform doesn't matter so much. It's whether the, the team around that platform has thought through what it takes to get into a scale-out architecture versus a scale-up architecture. Yeah, and I, I would even... Uh, say even more to the fact that like clustering, traditional clustering, like it, it's, it's a joke in the cloud. Most of the time it doesn't even work. So even on a Windows cluster when they say use clustering services, Microsoft doesn't <laughs> even recommend that anymore. Um, the other thing that we hear from our legacy customers or traditional enterprise customers are this uh, idea of licensing. You know, right now, today, it is extremely hard sometimes to license software and port it to the cloud, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous. I mean. Why would anybody care? Thanks, Jared. 
Sabu, if we come over your way, uh, the, the, the kind of next area that we all thought was a very interesting topic is around how workloads are allocated. So we've talked a little bit about what these workloads are, what these applications are, the attributes of enterprise workload. In your environment at eBay, could you talk a little bit about the kind of evolution of the last few years and, and how that's changed the way that you allocate workloads to certain platforms and perhaps touch on the idea or the topic of which workloads end up yeah. where and which workloads have stayed where they were or migrated over to where you are now? So uh, the transformation that we see at eBay is, is quite phenomenal. And since uh, about three and a half years ago, uh, we started the first generation cloud where the focus was automating front-end deployment from the moment you ready to push code, go through the stages of uh, uh, deployment across data centers to bring it up live in a few minutes. That was the awesome thing we did. People were happy. But today, if I look at it, it uh, just happens to be one of the use cases. It's all about heterogeneity. People do all kinds of weird things with cloud today. Once you put a malleable infrastructure, an infrastructure that they can code, agnes, and tweak things put together, and people come up with all sorts of use cases today. Like I've come across developers that do 500 node uh, Docker cluster for some CI workloads. I don't know how they did it, but they had the APIs to do that, what they need to do. Uh, the, the traditional platforms, the Hadoop clusters, all kinds of things are happening on the cloud today, and it happened just because there's an API to coding. And that turns out to be the, the most important part of I think. Yeah. That turned out to be the most important part of OpenStack. And Sabu, are you, could you talk a little bit about the, the... Bring it up, keep it going, maintain nine, four nines, five nines of time. That's always hard to move. And unless you are able to get all the building blocks from the cloud infrastructure, to be able to manage those at scale, uh, the pets won't go away. I think if we get just a bit more specific now, guys, if we go down a level deeper now, so we haven't talked at all about VMware versus OpenStack versus other things that are clearly emerging. So what specifically starts to end up on OpenStack? And you know, Jared and, and, and Jesse, you guys have different audiences you're targeting. Are there workloads that you're not going after, uh, given the nature of the two platforms that you're running? Can we start digging down a little bit deeper into the OpenStack VMware and, and other options uh, discussion a little if bit I, more? If I could, um, we're also beginning to see specialized clouds forming. Yes. Where it's a single API, right. but this cloud might be better suited for test. This cloud might be better suited for databases, um, et cetera. Vertical clouds, we call yeah. them. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So are you guys not targeting certain workloads, Jesse? Are yeah, you I mean, I think it's a great question. So on the, on the VMware side, and this goes back to kind of the, the COBOL point, like, it doesn't make sense with the customers that we work with, which are most, uh, most often SMEs, uh, it doesn't make sense to lift and shift a VMware workload. Like it's working, uh, it's working, it's operable. What we find is our customers want a cloud technology with, with a well-defined API that they can put adjacent to what's running today uh, and use that as a way to, to build that next generation technology integrated with what's, what's operating now. Um, but this, this notion of moving workloads, uh, we, we just don't see that that <coughs> planning out in reality. Couldn't, just to, just to Please. add, I couldn't agree more. And to Dave's point, there's a, there's a question before you ask yourself, are you going to move to OpenStack? It's a question of, is it even worth touching? You know, we, want, we want to uh, expend our resources in a very deliberate way. And you know, we have the same 40-year-old billing system issues that, that lots of companies do in our position. And we're never going to touch them. Um, and it's, as, as Dave said, it's not about laziness. It's not because um, you know, people don't want to design new systems in the right way. It's because it just doesn't make sense. Then I think you can get to the question of where should things run. And for us, there, is no, there's no, there are workloads that are harder to get to run on OpenStack Hmm. than other workloads, but I don't think there are workloads that you cannot run on OpenStack. We run latency-sensitive voice applications on top of the OpenStack infrastructure, and it works great. And it's a scale-out architecture, and when, when we have a problem and the, the voice conferencing system that we use goes down, it's, there's, another, there's another instance of it that is already running, and we're load balancing between the two of them. It's, just, it's not an issue if you've built the application correctly. If we can stick with you for just a second, Mark, because I think there's an interesting segue that we talked about. We wanted to cover some other areas here. So if, if you have a, a, a user in your community of users at Comcast who's very familiar or comfortable with VMware or the, the, the more of a dyed-in-the-wool enterprise user, maybe not as familiar with an SOA environment or the quote-unquote cattle environment, are there certain expectations that they have of OpenStack right now that they're uh, coming into the OpenStack? 
exact environment saying, ah, I, I can't do what I need to do in my quote unquote mindset right now. Again, I'm not trying to generalize too much here, but I want to get a sense for the reactions you're seeing of your kinds of users in your community inside Comcast. Sure. What, what are their expectations when they come into OpenStack? I have one, How are they being I have met? one favorite one, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of model myself after Jesse here, and then I'll throw the grenade and let somebody <laughs> else react to it. Um, Oracle. Oracle, I think, is the big hairy thing that everybody, you know, when I first came to Comcast uh, seven years ago, every single database, it felt like, I'm not sure this is actually true, but every database felt like it was an Oracle database. It was the tool for storing any piece of data at the company. And unwinding that, to my earlier point about developers, was tough. Um, and now as we have a successfully unwound it in some places, trying to migrate work onto any virtualized infrastructure, but especially onto OpenStack, it's been tough to do with Oracle. Yeah, you know, one thing that I would probably comment on just uh, legacy environments, at CenturyLink, it's an 85-year-old company. So, you know, if you want something old, they have it. <laughs> it it's amazing. Um, and we've been, you know, we were acquired in November, so we're about a year old, which is inside the company. And, and one thing that we've seen very powerful is even in that old of company, they have, I think they said, up to 18,000 VMs that wow. they just run internally. And it's spread across the board. You know, some of it's for network virtualization. A lot of it's for internal core back office stuff. And what we've learned from the customers is when they come and talk to us about how to port something over, they already have it virtualized. It really comes down to SLAs. It comes down to what their their expectations are of that that VM and how it's being maintained. And there's a lot of things that they're not going to move. You know, you know, CenturyLink has eight different billing systems on the back end. You know, they did a lot of acquisitions over the last decade, and some of them they they plan on getting rid of. But realistically, moving those is extremely hard to do and very inefficient. And so they would rather pour all 18,000 VMs over, basically almost lift and shift where it does become something easy for them, but there's a lot of applications they're gonna keep on bare metal for a while until, you know, even even us, which is pretty high grade. Please survive. Hold I'm not sure if this is working, but okay. Go right ahead, it's you on. can speak it's up. Uh, this okay, is a small so, room. So I yeah. was actually want to uh, dwell on something that both Subu uh, and uh, Mark touched upon. To Subu's excellent point, uh, and again, I'm coming from the vendor side, I see a lot of vendors, uh, of uh, potential customers, actually customers looking at pets are the hardest to move, right? With Oracle being the archetypal example of that, right? So uh, do you see that uh, uh, a push or a desire for, uh, for the quote unquote enterprise or legacy customers that have everything old, right? That, and they need to drag that along. He said, why, 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 why isn't OpenStack supporting more of the legacy kind of stuff that we need to drag along. Uh, that's exactly what we're talking about. I, 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 spot on. I mean, it's, it's, is there anything that they don't find in OpenStack that they're expecting? Why isn't OpenStack able to do what I needed to do for this particular so, workload? Uh, and and to, to, to take that to its logical end, in other words, having OpenStack a VMware to RESTful APIs with open source. So basically an open source VMware to RESTful APIs, right? When Are we trying to stretch the philosophy of OpenStack too far to make it do pets things that it wasn't Actually, designed uh, to do? I, I want to contradict that Let's, point. That's why we want to... Yeah, I want to contradict that point. I think it is not... As Thank an you. operator of OpenStack for the last two plus years, I don't think it is the responsibility of OpenStack to evolve itself to deal with pets better. Thank I you. Think, I think we have to move towards cattle. And OpenStack... What I want OpenStack to give me as an operator is enough building blocks so that I can influence a change from pets to cattle. Today, I'm not able to do that as much as I would like to. There are some gaps that I need to get out of OpenStack. What are and, those gaps? And, Sorry. I mean, if, we've if got, I... If we've got, this is exactly where we need to land. We've got to go get through everybody in this amazing panel. And <laughs> Sibu, you nailed it. Okay, so if we, we want to get right into the last question, we, we can't do everything. And we've got to have at least two minutes for everybody to talk through some of the ideas they had. If you're looking ahead over the next year and then out to 2020, what are the key things that you would change about where we're focusing right now and the kind of specific attributes of the, the product roadmap, quote unquote, for OpenStack that you'd focus on that would make uh, OpenStack more attractive to VMware users, OpenStack more attractive to enterprise users. F characterize it however you like, but yeah. I'm trying to not I, get into I, like not... VMware versus OpenStack or anything like that. It's more about the, the nature of a, a dyed in the wool enterprise user who's yeah. looking at OpenStack, trying to figure out how to use it more effectively. What would attract more enterprises to use OpenStack more effectively from your perspective, Mark? So just a, just a meta comment to start with. You know, we had this identity thing of a year or so ago where we were all worried about 
OpenStack's identity relative to AWS, and I don't want the new identity crisis for OpenStack to be how are we relative to VMware right on, or right any on. other pri yeah. provider. I think we need to evolve on our own, as Sabu said. And I think for me, the, the single biggest set of, well, maybe I'll list a couple things and I won't limit myself to single, but uh, stability at scale. Yep. So there's stability when you have tens of VMs, there's stability when you have hundreds of VMs, there's stability when you have thousands or tens of thousands of VMs. We, most of our um, uh, deployments today are in the several hundreds of VMs in terms of size, and we are having stability issues. When we're moving hundreds of gigabits worth of data through the sort of OpenStack cloud, one instance of it, we see stability issues. We cannot take our core businesses and run it on top of an infrastructure that has stability issues at a few hundreds of VMs and a few hundred worth of gigabits. I mean, we have infrastructures that I'm responsible for at Comcast that move tens of terabits per second that I would love to use OpenStack to orchestrate the data center for. And there's no chance I would think about doing that until we get stability and scalability under control. We do it by hand. It's all the classic bare metal stuff. You know, Pixie Boot and Chef Puppet. Um, I don't think, it doesn't get to that level of scale. So when we're, when we're moving 10 plus terabits on a platform, on an infrastructure, uh, we, don't, we don't virtualize that infrastructure today. Um, the, the VMware infrastructure at Comcast, just to maybe answer your question a little bit uh, to the side, um, is many multiples larger than the OpenStack-based infrastructure. Uh, it probably doesn't do very network-intensive loads. It does somewhat network-intensive loads, like maybe tens of gigabits, as opposed to single gigabits that we're doing uh, mainly on OpenStack today. Jesse, where would you focus our energy over the next year and, and the, the big, hairy, audacious goal for 2020 on the five-year horizon to yeah. attract more enterprise workloads? So. Again, I think that the key here is to change the conversation from how do we move enterprise workloads to talk about how do we, yes. uh, how do we sit next to adjacent to enterprise workloads and, and be that platform for next generation applications. Uh, stability is, is obviously a challenge. We heard in the keynotes. Uh, there, you can stand up an OpenStack cloud today and run a pretty consistent set of commands to make it fall over. Like it, it just happens. And I think that the challenge there is that you've got this huge open source set of developers uh, with a very wide uh, range of experiences working on distributed systems. Uh, and you've got developers who aren't operators. And so uh, I think the foundation has and continues to do a very good job or a better job getting the operator's voice uh, integrated into, uh, into the, uh, the project itself. Uh, but stability, I mean, it's, it's really it, stability. How do you get that core, how do you define what core is and get that core uh, rock solid so that we can stop hearing these stories of people who stood up clouds and, and abandoned the project because they didn't work? I, I would just want to re-echo echo that to what Common JC made. Define a core, make it solid, keep it long term. Um, so I would say the pretty much the same thing that Jesse said, that you just seconded. OpenStack really needs a solid and scalable, um, both both solid at a small scale, an individual VM. That workload has to be able to be kept up for, for five nines. Even if the machine has to go into maintenance, we need to be able to port that workload around seamlessly and at a very large scale, tens of thousands of VMs also be stable. Um, but we also need an ecosystem of platforms on top of that. And so right now, that's one of the problems that we're tackling. Um, a, a services? Services ecosystem. market, not, not market, but developer market yeah. um, ecosystem. Also, one point just to bring up, sort of stepping out, um, OpenStack, we've talked a lot about virtualization. I see it as an abstraction layer there's already work being done to abstract physical layers of infrastructure within OpenStack. Mm -hmm. So that might be one of the next steps. Super in very big. <laughs> <laughs> I can take it for you if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Devin Devananda. Yeah. So I agree that uh, it has to become more stable to be usable, especially at scale. Um, that's the only way that trust is going to end up being built for the, uh, for the really what becomes the early and late majority to uh, adopt OpenStack in the enterprise. And I think that's going to take time, um, but I think it's very much needed. My view is, though, if we go to the 2020 view, um, that it's really about services and other things that really... Um, Today, you see in uh, in the the 
the few legitimate players that are in the platform as a service space, I see those capabilities being the things that need to be bubbled up uh, and that's what needs to be tightly integrated and living on top of OpenStack for, uh, for the benefits to be there. The other point I would make would be um, the one thing that could get people to move all of those legacy applications um, over sooner is in ease of moving them and uh, the, the push for them to get away from the Oracle tax. And if you, if you look at the ever uh, increasing licenses, um, if you can move away from that, uh, the cost differential over two to three years might be enough for you to rewrite that application mm -hmm. and make the move. Um, if you could make that easier um, mm -hmm. on developers and for enterprises in an easier business case, uh, then I think you'd see more rapid adoption. Thanks, Dave. So uh, in our work at uh, Ravelo, we are comparing the stability, SLA, and performance of several clouds, not only OpenStack clouds, including the other ones. And I can tell you the situation there is sometimes better, but it's not like it's uh, completely, uh, you know, the pets environment where everything is stable and everything is great. My conclusion from that is that running infrastructure at that scale, it's complicated. Hmm. And one of the ways to deal with this, I think uh, some of the previous talk here talked about it, is to focus on the core. Saying things, this is not what we do, or we don't do this thing, is a great uh, value. In general, in product marketing or product management, to say, yes, we are doing, this is the core, this is what we are doing, and this is what we are not doing. Strategy, somebody smarter than me said it, is the things that we don't do. So saying that we don't do a few things and focus on the things that we do and do them really good is uh, what will get us there. Just to finish, I'll give you from my previous life in communication, when you compare the evolution of TDM to IP. IP became very cheap, but it became something very simple oversubscribe where there are many deficiencies in the core itself of the IP and it's being handled in the perimeters. So things that the core doesn't do are being mm -hmm. propagated to perimeter. In our case, it will be to the tool, to the orchestration tool, to the application, things around it. So focusing on the things that... Outside of OpenStack, outside of VMware, a lot of buzz about containers, uh, Kubernetes, Mesos, CoreOS. Uh, again, this is about competing and attracting workloads regardless of the enterprise discussion we've been having. So but again, how do we make OpenStack more attractive vis-a-vis -vis the attributes of CoreOS and Kubernetes and Mesos? How do you see the two or three of these circles coming together and the diversity of the environment continuing to proliferate as it's going on? How, do, how does OpenStack remain an attractive workload platform and attract things so with these other, other things emerging? Once again, I see OpenStack as an abstraction layer. Yes. Those fit in just fine under the abstraction layer. Now, the, the details of how the Nova abstraction layer might be used for containers need to be worked out. Agreed. But again, containerization, uh, virtualization, f bare metal, common abstraction layer for it. Different yeah. vertical clouds to provide different functionality for different needs. I run into this debate a lot. I mean, we have these alternatives today, and what is the right thing to do for a company? for a company, for an operator. I think today, uh, as they have said before, OpenStack is not cloud, so is VMware is not cloud. Cloud is a service that you put together, providing all the building blocks. And if you look at Mesos, Kubernetes, and all these things are giving me patterns, commoditize the patterns that I need to do for efficiency, for example. I can run 1,000 CI jobs with a pool of 100 VMs. I can do that with Mesos. That's a pattern. I need the building blocks, which is provided by the cloud as a, as a layer of abstraction underneath the layered cake. I see that as a layered cake with stuff building on top of each other. Yeah, I think one of the things OpenStack's done very well, particularly in the last, uh, last year or so, uh, is uh, it's become sort of the standard open cloud API. Uh, and so you look at uh, tools like all the, the DevOps tools, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, they all speak to OpenStack. You look at uh, cloud management platforms, they all speak to OpenStack. And so now we've got this defined thing that uh, people are writing their, their technologies to speak with. Uh, that, that's really powerful. So as we look at adding new technologies, adding support for Docker, um, the, the fact is we've got our, our language defined, um, and, and the abstraction piece holds a lot of weight. Any other thoughts, guys? Thanks a lot. This was fantastic. Thanks for the discussion, guys. Really appreciate it. <laughs>